How the shit did they get into the same division, let alone the same platoon as him? You specifically requested transfer from Fort Cronkite to this training unit? Sir, I heard it was the best, sir! Starship Troopers. It is a criminally underused and undervalued science fiction setting. And it really is one of the better ones out there as well, particularly when you start really diving down into the lore and the theories and the ideas of the universe. The book, obviously, is an absolute must-read, in my opinion, and the first movie is a cult classic for a reason, despite often being horribly misunderstood. Stood. Which I do suppose is <laughs> fitting, as the book does have that issue as well. But I, obviously, adore the setting, and I have made two lore videos on it in the past, along with two less serious videos, kind of following up on some of the takes of the actual proper lore. Because make no mistake, the movies in particular <laughs> absolutely have more than their fair share of silly in them. But the cinema sin video on Starship Troopers, I now I I watch cinema sins. I think they make some really good stuff on occasion. But boy, they did not even watch this movie, as demonstrated by the opening clip. And since I do feel rather strongly about Starship Troopers, I wanna go through it a little bit for comedic purposes. Again, don't get me wrong, I like cinema sins. I watch their stuff, I'm subscribed to their channel, but I like Starship Troopers more, so let's have a little bit of a look at it, shall we? Let's begin also with this point right here, because it is by far the most immediately salient, and the point where pretty much everyone starts misunderstanding Starship Troopers. Naked Force has resolved more issues throughout history than any other factor. Paul Verhoeven clearly sees satire as a blunt object that must be used to beat the viewer over the head repeatedly before inserting it into various orbices. I will also state right now for the record that mayhaps this is simply just an incredibly clever piece of comedic satire on behalf of CinemaSins, because Paul Verhoeven quite famously didn't even read Starship Troopers before making a movie about it. So maybe CinemaSins not watching the movie is simply just a meta-commentary on Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> I mean, I'm not ruling out the possibility. But anywho here. What Ratchek is saying right here is absolutely true. There is no other thing throughout the entirety of human history that has settled more issues than force. Just think about it for a second. What other thing could possibly have settled more issues than force? What? Diplomacy? <laughs> Diplomacy is nothing more than force in one of its myriad forms. A peace treaty, for example, is one nation saying, stop hitting me, and the other nation going, okay, but you're going to give me this, or I am going to continue hitting you. What about arbitration, then, by a third party? Well, that stems, of course, from authority. And, as Ratchek goes on to say, But when you vote, you are exercising political authority. You're using force. And force, my friends, is violence. The supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Authority is force, in one of its myriad different forms. And force, in turn, is authority because it draws its power from violence. And at the very least, the threat of violence, the supreme authority, the gold standard of all human interactions. And I know. Many of us uh, people in the civilized world will have an immediate knee-jerk reaction to that. No, 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 we are not some savage barbarian tribe. We are not bands of monkeys. We are not our long-gone ancestors. We resolve matters through civil discourse, through arbitration, through the legal system and the courts. But think about that for a moment then. What is our legal system? It is the government saying, follow these rules that hopefully we as a society have agreed upon, and if you do not, we will send the police after you, and they will have the authority to put you in handcuffs, to beat you if you resist, and drag you off to prison. 
What is that, if not authority via force? Now, of course, we are boiling things down here to their very most basic elements. We are ignoring all of the high-minded ideals that go in behind the creation of these laws and our modern society. But at the end of the day, the court system's ability to enforce its rulings on you is only because of their power to send people with sticks to your house to enforce that ruling upon you. And as I am sure we can all agree, a law that cannot be enforced might as well not be a law at all. It might as well not exist because there is absolutely no consequence for breaking it. And to boil it down even further to prove the supreme authority of the thing, if one caveman says to another, give me your apple or I shall bonk you over the head with this heavy stick, the only options available to the other caveman is to give over the apple or reach for his own boinking stick. You can appeal to all of the high-minded ideals you want in such a situation. Oh, but Mr. Caveman, if you do that, you'll be committing a vile deed. You will be stealing from me, and that's immoral. To which the other caveman will and all you likely would simply say, I'm hungry, and I don't care. Give me the apple. <laughs> and so again... The only response to violence that will not back down in the face of arguments is to either surrender or answer violence with violence, making it the supreme authority. Now that was quite a little bit of a wander off into some heavier topics, wasn't it? Million dialogue and such stuff. But I do believe it is very important to actually give this a proper hearing. Because this is the point where, as uh, so ably demonstrated by CinemaSins, most people begin to misunderstand Starship Troopers. And to be fair, this is in large part the fault of Paul Verhoeven, who tried to bend and break Starship Troopers into a satire of fascism which it simply just isn't. The only way the Ted and Federation can have any authority over a private individual beyond them breaking the law is if they choose to sign up for a period of federal service. <laughs> well, a fascist state where the state has practically no power over the individual. <laughs> it certainly is an interesting take on fascism. But again, it is due to the seemingly heavy-handed boiling down of the concept of authority that most people react to with the knee-jerk reaction of, oh, we don't base our society off violence, whereas if you actually break it down, oh yeah, we do. It is literally the fundament of our entire civilization, in fact. But... Let's move over to something slightly more light-hearted, shall we? So, what was his real motivation? Citizenship or boners? Movie ain't interested in explaining any of that. Except, of course, for the fact that he spends the first 20 minutes of the movie explaining just that. Johnny Rico is very clearly affected by the words of his history and moral philosophy's teacher, to the point that he seeks him out at the school dance to get a little bit of advice from him, at which point the fascist recruitment officer tells Johnny to make up his own mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's <laughs> well, the freedom to choose is at the end of the day really the only true freedom we have strange point of view for a fascist but details details and of course Johnny is also absolutely guided by the urges of his little old winker on more than one occasion here, though to be fair, if you had the opportunity to boink Denise Richard, you'd probably be diverting a significant portion of your brain power to the region as well. And, as the fine little push, when he tells his family that he is going to sign up, his father blows a casket as he is categorically against the idea of federal service and shouts at him as he leaves the house. If you step out of that door, you are disowned! What kind of an effect do you think that will typically have on a headstrong young man? <laughs> yes, that, if anything, was what truly sealed the deal right there. I'm wondering, has there ever been a firm, fair, and or pleasant drill instructor in cinematic history? Yes, there is. In fact, you're looking right at him. Zim is a 
thoroughly sympathetic character who not only sticks his neck out for Rico after he fucks up massively, reducing what would normally have been an instant discharge, if not indeed field marshal level offense. You think there's any possibility of salvaging this man? Yes, sir, I do. To administrative punishment. Lay down on this, son. It helps. I know. And then during the administrative punishment, he walks up to Rico and hands him, mouths him, a piece of cardboard wrapped in string, I'm not actually entirely sure, and tells him to bite down on it and that it'll help. And most tellingly of all, that he knows he's fucked up in the past too. And he's letting Rico know that, that there is a way back from this, no matter how ginormous the cock-up might be. And that's not even all of it. Shortly thereafter, after Johnny Rico has signed the forms to officially leave the mobile infantry but then changes his mind, he goes to the commander and says that he doesn't want to quit anywho. The commander says, you've made your decision, you're out, son. At which point Zim gives the commander a knowing little glance. The commander simply turns away and... Is this your signature, Rico? Sir, yes it is, sir. Doesn't look like it to me. Carry on, Frank. Yes, sir. Good boy, Zim. Not to mention, of course, this too. Forget it, Zim. We need you here. I want combat, sir. The only way you're gonna see combat is if you bust yourself to private. Get me? Yes, sir. I get you. <laughs> it was a drill instructor named Zim who captured a brain. Firm, fair, and pleasant. Ah, yes. Before we even begin, allow me to just... There we go, yes. I don't have the connections that CinemaSins do, so I think we'll, uh... We'll double up on the security there. You know, double bag it, just to be safe. Also, also, I get that this is the future and all, but why does that future involve co-ed showering? Nothing else is appreciably different aside from the bugs. The technology looks like a slightly souped-up version of the late 90s OS. The clothes are similar, and the school system is about the same. But somewhere between 1997 and 2200-something, someone important decided this sexist showering practice must end. Ah yes, the school system appears to be just about the same thing, with its mandatory classes in history and moral philosophy. I remember those vividly from my own school days, I do. Oh, and the giant monitor that allows you to see everybody's scores and display them publicly as well. <laughs> Though, to be fair, you can't really uh, criticize cinema sins too much on this point because the whole nude shower scene thing is purely a figment of the Hoven's own imagination. Now, the book does touch upon this slightly more, but not quite this specific thing right here. It mentions that women tend to be better pilots, and so virtually all women who sign up for federal service will be sent to flying duties of one form or another. Though it does also mention that supposedly there was a female MI soldier somewhere in a different regiment, but it's unclear whether or not that was simply a myth or actual reality. The thing is, at the top of it, the Terran Federation is an absolute meritocracy, where you are simply placed wherever there is a need for you once you sign on to your period of federal service, and you have an absolute uninfringible right to complete your federal service and take up your position and privileges as a citizen, even going so far as to state in the book that the medical personnel cannot fail or reject anyone. Even if you are blind or deaf, they are required by law to find something that you can do to complete your federal service. In fact, the only way that they have of rejecting anyone is if the psychologist determines that the individual in question is literally not capable of understanding the oath that they are required to take. That is the only way. And in such a universe where nobody cares about your gender, your race, your heritage, or 
any other characteristic that you can't actually control, obviously, because you're born that way, co-ed showers certainly wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility. Though the books also make it clear that women do tend to be treated differently and more nicely in a chivalrous fashion, because, well, the book is ancient as all hell. It hasn't quite gotten to experience modernity, shall we say. At this point in their training, why are they not learning how to kill bugs? That's exactly why they're here. Ah, now that is an interesting point, but why, Cinema Sins, are you assuming that they are training to fight the bugs? This is another very common misunderstanding about Starship Troopers that I'm actually vaguely confused as to how it happened, so let me play you the next clip here to demonstrate the point. And I guess you can't chase after the asteroid and just blow it up. Oh, well, planetary defense systems are better than ever, so I've been told, and so I'm sure this asteroid won't cause any problems. This is another one of those they just didn't actually watch the bloody movie type of moments, because at the very beginning of the movie, in fact one of the very first scenes you see, has the announcer specifically say, with this exact footage, that the bugs are sending another meteor our way, and that planetary defense systems are better than ever. The asteroid that hits Buenos Aires is the first shot in the bug war. It is the arachnids attacking humanity, and after that humanity is reacting. Humanity is not the aggressor in this war, humanity is the victim of this war. I'm sure it's f***ing lovely down there, and I definitely want to visit someday, but why the hell did the bugs target Buenos Aires for the asteroid? Sure, we were in the future, and things may have changed a bit, but is New York not important anymore? London? Rio? Geneva? Moscow? Delhi? Tokyo? This, too, is a very important point. Why didn't the bugs hit London, Rio, Geneva, Moscow, Delhi, or Tokyo? Because they're bugs. They don't think like us. They do not necessarily view metropolises as strategic targets, as centres of government or control. They simply view it as areas with lots of humans. The species that they are currently waging a war of extermination against, as demonstrated by the settlers of a certain fort. The clip for which I am not going to show you on YouTube, because even Cinema Sins, with all of their connections, <laughs> didn't show you that one. <laughs> Nevertheless, the movie makes it absolutely clear that it is not the Terran Federation that's starting any of this, it is the Bugs. And it makes it further clear that the Bugs don't view us as something that they can negotiate with. Or hell, even something that they want to negotiate with. This is a war of extermination started by the Bugs, and humanity is defending itself. All of this is horrible, which is the point. This is a society that believes in public lashing. Is it going to make Rico a better soldier? No! Will this inform his decisions from now on? Not really. Does it make the movie any better? I guess it allows the viewer a peek into the sinister foundation upon which this world is built. But we got that from the Do You Wanna Know More videos, so I'm not sure why we need this scene. Now we're gonna roll the clock back a little bit here to an earlier scene, but this one's interesting as well. Because, as they say, this scene is horrible, sure, public lashings are not pleasant, but the sinister foundations upon which this world is built. But how sinister is this, really? Okay, it is administrative punishment, it is physical punishment, a lashing. That's nasty, but what crime is Johnny Rico guilty of here? He ordered one of his men, a soldier that he was responsible for, to take off his helmet during a live fire exercise. That is manslaughter at the very least, and quite possibly worse. Rico got a person killed, a person he was responsible for. I can guarantee you this, the punishments that are handed out for that sort of crime in our current day society may not be as immediately visceral as a lashing, but it will have a much greater consequence on your life. It depends upon the nation of course, but you're looking at a year or more in prison, time in which your entire life just stops, grinds to a complete halt, 
Not to mention your criminal record afterwards, whereas in the case of administrative punishment, that is all wiped clean, and no one will ever mention this to Rico ever again. If I was given the choice between going to prison for a year, if not more, or ten lashes, <laughs> I wouldn't even need five minutes to think about the answer to that question. So wait, after fighting with a pilot who's stealing your ex-girlfriend, you get a death from above tattoo? Isn't that what the pilots would get, and not what people who fight on the ground get? Literally the next scene is the mobile infantry, the starship troopers, the goddamn title, <laughs> deploying to Klendarthu via dropships launched from starships. Why indeed would they want a death from above tattoo? <laughs> oh, heavens. Ace, what are we doing? Just a minute ago, you fired nukes at those missile defecating bugs. Do you not have any more of those? Ah yes, shooting the bugs five meters in front of you with a nuclear weapon large enough to destroy a plasma bug in one hit. Sounds like a brilliant idea. Even more so when you add in that a little bit later on in the movie, a cinema sense also says this. Roughnecks survived this. I don't care if Nukem was a little hyperbole, that was a massive explosion, and their asses should be dead as f***ing disco right now. The mobile infantry just can't win, can they? You know it's gonna be a somber message, since it's in black and white. And also, why are they even admitting the defeat and retreat? This is the propaganda channel, right? I thought they were trying to recruit kids, not inform them of a tragic loss of life that awaits them if they sign up. Oh, it's... <laughs> it's almost too good. They are so close to actually figuring it out. Yes, Cinema Sense. Why would the propaganda channel, <laughs> with a live uncensored broadcast from the invasion, <laughs> be reporting on a defeat and a retreat with the casualty numbers? <laughs> and, and why, after this, will the Sky Marshal step down and take responsibility for the military disaster? <laughs> why? Why does this happen in this deeply sinister society? <laughs> but instead of just taking a step back and going, huh, this doesn't add up, they simply just... Soldier on! <sighs> What's that saying again? Ignorance is bliss? I can believe it. This movie is kind of like Ender's Game, only no one learns any lessons. And that's the point, I suppose. But I kind of wish someone like Carmen or Jake Busey or Cut in Half Michael Ironside would make a realization that something is maybe a tad f***ed up about all the shit they've done, even if they shrug it off afterwards. And on that note, let's actually wrap it up with this final one here as well. There is some other dumb dumb scenes as well, but let's not get too nitpicky. Most of the complete and utter blatant ignorance of basic military tactics is in all due likelihood, you know, for comedic effect, but I would like to address this last part. Because again, it touches upon the misunderstanding of Starship Troopers. Would make a realization that something is maybe a tad fucked up about all the shit they've done. But what though? What has humanity done wrong in this scenario? Humanity was attacked, one-sidedly so, by essentially a giant space nuke falling out of the sky, completely unprovoked, unasked for, and humanity hadn't even prepared for it, making it very clear that they didn't expect it either, and then they have millions of people wiped out immediately after which they launch a quick offensive to try and end the war swiftly and get absolutely annihilated, after which they are now fighting a losing war, desperately trying to figure out what the hell they're fighting, and then proving the hypothesis that the enemy is far more intelligent than just bugs. And it turns out, Yes, they are. And that also condemns the arachnids even further, because if there are brain bugs, if they are intelligent, if they are not merely just insects, then they are trying to eradicate humanity with the full and absolute knowledge of what they are doing. The bugs are genocidal, and they know what they are doing. The bugs are clearly the bad guys here. It is 
absolutely self-evident. There is absolutely no doubt, no question about that. And yet, the CinemaSins crew arrive at the conclusion that it's the humans that need to realize that what they're doing is a tad effed up. <laughs> Well, again, uh, pr presuming that they are satirizing Paul Verhoeven's not reading of the book by not watching the movie, I suppose all I can really say is uh, applause. <laughs> Good job, CinemaSense. You sure had me going. The alternative explanation, and perhaps the more realistic one, though, is, again, Starship Troopers is often simply just labeled as some kind of fascist movie, which it so absolutely is not. The book is the absolute exact opposite of that, and the movie, too, in what it shows you from the book, is that as well. But I suppose that merely seeing grey uniforms and the occasional trench coat is enough to make people go, Nazis. It is a sad state of affairs, but if you want to learn more about how the Ted and Federation actually works, then I would recommend, shameless shell, shameless self shill, my video on Starship Troopers Law, the Ted and Federation Service Guarantees Citizenships. It's 55 minutes long, so perhaps a bit hefty, but it is interesting, I promise. Plus, it's got more of this adorable artwork. Anywho. I will wrap it up there. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.